uh, back of chest, the weak muscles are rhomboids and lower middle trapezius. Uh, the, the back of neck, the tight muscles are upper trapezius, deep, deep neck extensors, levator scapulae. Uh, and the front of neck muscles are deep cervical flexors. There. They are weak. So this alternate patterns of tightness and weakness is very difficult to understand, very easy to understand and probably we all have uh, seen these kind of cases. Uh, now we'll go a little deep into that. Why upper cross syndrome happens? Primarily it happens because of poor posture. As you can see this person, now this is what we have become. This person who is sitting on the computer. Throughout the day, if you if you have a recent version of Android phone or any other uh, operating system phone, if you go into the wellness, then you will find out that you have spent in this Corona time four, five, six, seven, up to ten hours in front of your mobile or your system. Uh, so that's our body is not meant to be like that. We are becoming like a tree. This this lady uh, signifies that we have become like a tree. You know, we are. We are not meant to be like that. We are meant to move. But uh, this poor sitting posture makes us uh, uh, to, to have this kind of posture position. Which So these muscles are kept in this position and then the muscle solidifies and forms upper cross syndrome. <clears throat> One of the major role of this is because of writing reaction. That means whatever position your rest of the body is, your neck is hardwired to be in a vertical position because of your writing reaction. So whether you are sitting in a slouch sitting or whether you are sitting with, with forward bend, you need to look forward. Even same thing happens if I put you on a gym ball and tilt left and right. Your neck tends to remain, your eyesight neck tends to uh, remain straight. And that's why this posture happens. Uh, other cause, a little lesser common cause is selective activation or strengthening. We have seen that pectoralis major, pectoralis minor becomes tight, upper trapezius becomes tight. This may happen if you do some activity such as, such as swimming. In swimmers, upper cross syndrome is very common. Uh, and uh, for that you need to do, the swimmer, a regular swimmer need to do a lot of stretches. When I say regular swimmer, I mean competitive swimmers. A competitive swimmer may need to swim about 10,000 meters a day in his regular practice. So they have, they have this kind of muscle imbalances. But more common muscle imbalance you will get to see in, in people who are, who are building their body in a hurry. You know, suppose a film star who is getting launched after two months or uh, you want a six pack by, by Diwali or by New Year. So you are going to work selectively on the muscles, which is not physiological. And that is why you, you'll end up strengthening the muscles, which, which are more visible, for example, the pectorals, and you will end up uh, leaving away the muscles, which are difficult to strengthen and not as visible, for example, your, your retractors. So that is another reason. And finally, the major culprit, uh, we all have become like this. We all are looking at our screens, even right now, and I'm the culprit here, sorry. Uh, but we, we are becoming this monkey who is, who is, whose world is within that six inch screen, which is again, not physiological. We are supposed to move. Uh, so these are the major causes of upper cross syndrome. Now what happens? And primary uh, sequelae we had seen is the alternate patterns of muscle tightness and muscle weakness. Tight pectorals, tight upper trap, weak deep cervical flexes and uh, weak rhomboids and serratus. But if you go a little deeper, what you get to see is increased weight of head. Now, uh, how do I explain this is, uh, Kapanji in his, in his uh, biomechanics book has shown in calculation for each inch forward the neck goes from, from neutral position. If I'm one inch forward, my neck's apparent weight increases by 10 pounds. How does it happen? Why the head is not increasing the mass? How the weight increases? Is because as we move the neck forward, the liver arm increases. Understand this? When we are sitting in a neutral position, the, 
the liver is a first order liver the fulcrum is in the in the uh, vertebra the the uh, effort is in the back and the load is in front so it becomes a first order liver however the moment i go into slouch my head has to lift from c7 vertebra onwards so what happens is the fulcrum comes at one end and it becomes effectively a third order liver because the uh, cog of the head remains more or less same here and the fulcrum is here the effort is in the middle that means the muscles of the neck extensor have to work tremendously and with one inch the neck goes forward the apparent weight of the head increases about 10 pounds that is about say five and a half kg two inch 20 pounds three inch if the neck is forward and we all have seen people who are having more than three inch neck forward the weight of the head becomes uh, about 30 pounds extra so the total weight of the head becomes somewhere around 20 kg uh, which is otherwise five five and a half kg so understand this we all have seen especially people who are who are in an area where there is water scarcity ladies carrying these weights in the in the in, in their head carrying these water uh, containers in their head imagine if i'm if i'm having upper cross syndrome if i'm sitting like this actually i am also carrying a 20 liter uh, jar in my head only thing is that is invisible or if you if you are thinking of a, in terms of a 5 year old kid uh, you are moving around with a 5 year old kid sitting in your head all the time that much is the pressure on your head so it is not only alternate patterns of tightness and weakness it is also the weight of the head the apparent weight of the head that increases and because of that atlanto occipital joint is involved the c4 c5 segment wherever at the area where there is weight bearing will be involved so c4 c5 segment will be involved the cervical thoracic junction will be involved the t4 t5 segment will be involved because again t4 t5 segment is the place where there is maximum distance from the line of gravity so as this happens the the momentum increases and the problem happens so these are the areas where the patients complain of maximum pain these are the areas where there is maximum compression these are the areas there is maximum load then what happens in the also uh, coming back to cervical atlanta occipital joint because there is atlanta occipital hyperextension because of that the posterior structures become tight and we'll come to that a little later again uh, what happens in the shoulder now upper cross syndrome is primarily the problem of uh, muscles but is the joint also involved yes because as the pectoralis major minor becomes tight the shoulder will become protracted as the shoulder protracted what is going to happen to the coracoacromial space reduced through that space what structure comes through the coracoacromial space comes the supraspinatus tendon that will be compressed now this supraspinatus tendon is already a very poor structure doesn't get enough food why because it goes straight and suddenly there is a bend the kink the muscle goes like that through the tunnel the coracoacromial arch and then the insertion is in the uh, greater tuberosity the first impression as we know so there is a bend already the tendon also is poor in blood supply but the weight plus the weight in the upper limb also squeezes it again if you do a protraction then the pressure on the tendon is too much that means the supraspinatus tendon will be will be uh, less in circulation and wherever there is an injury that tendon will not heal properly the tendon will be squeezed that goes to produce impingement and if there is injury it will not heal it will be a chronic tendinitis and uh, then the sequelae will happen also there will be a scapular dyskinesia and there will be thoracic outlet syndrome because again everything is compressed here will i have a better picture i guess thoracic outlet syndrome it will come later then what happens is there is also reduced ribcage excursion all of you who are sitting there if you can try a little bit of shoulder protraction and try a, try taking a deep breath you will see that your rib excursion is less compared to when you are sitting straight and taking the same deep inhalation so that is some sort of uh, 
restriction you are making in the thoracic cage. Plus there is trigger points which produces headache and then it also perpetuates lower cross syndrome. Uh, so what do you observe? How the posture becomes? You can actually make something called a spot diagnosis with upper cross syndrome. You can look at a patient and you can understand. As you can see, the, the neck goes forward, the shoulders are protracted. In the left side, this lady, if she is corrected, if she is in corrected posture, then, then the head, that is the ear, the shoulder and the hip, which is not seen, should be in a straight line. Otherwise, it makes a zigzag line. I would also draw your attention to the prominence of uh, uh, sternomastoid in the second picture in this lady itself when she is in poor posture, number one. Second, look at her mouth. When she is having a protracted uh, neck, she also has her mouth opening. She will, because of the tightness of these muscles in the front of the neck, there is also another picture coming in. Uh, so that will also make this person a mouth breather. Plus look at the back of the neck. You can see the tightness in the upper trapezius and the protracted neck. And you can also look at the increased kyphosis of the thoracic spine. So it, it not only produces local problem, but it moves into global problem. The picture in the middle, this boy who is lying down, if you look at this person, you can see the right shoulder is more protracted. Uh, this happens because of the tightness of the pectoralis minor. Again, it is a spot diagnosis as the person to lie down and you can look at the person's shoulder and you can find out the pectoralis minor tightness. However, what interests me more is the frontal view, the last picture, the picture on the right side. As you can see, the upper trapezius is more prominent. The pector, the, the uh, sternomastoid is pretty prominent as, as the person protracts the neck, but you cannot see those things very well in the, in the frontal plane. What you can see, however, is the position of the hand. If you have studied Dina Gardiner starting position or standing position, you will find that normal standing position has the palms looking inward next to the thigh in the midline of the body. Now this fellow, as you can see, his palm is not neutral, it is medially rotated and from midline of the body, it is coming anterior in the anterior part of the thigh, which means that number one, there is a tightness of the medial rotator. Number two, the tightness of a little bit of some, some sort of flexors. That is because of the tightness of the pectoralis major. So if you look at a person who stands like this, and this person is at least more or less symmetrical, many of the people with upper cross syndrome will have one hand more towards the midline, other hand more laterally. That means there is a difference in the tightness of the pectoral muscles also. But this is what you observe in three planes, in frontal plane, in sagittal plane, as well as in transverse plane, the tightness of the structures, the imbalance, the zigzag uh, position in the in the lateral view. And in the lateral view, you can also make a quantification. This quantification is by a craniovertebral angle. This is very easy to measure. What do you do? You take a lateral view, you take a, a dead lateral view and you take, uh, take a simple snap. Then in that snap, draw two lines, one line from the tragus of the ear to the C7 vertebra, another just horizontal. This angle is known as craniovertebral angle, the number one measure of, of upper cross syndrome. In fact, you don't need to measure anything else other than this. Of course, you can measure the muscle strength of the deep cervical flexors and all this, but that needs a good kind of equipment. This you can measure very easily. Just taking a simple lateral view, putting it into your computer and two lines. The average value of this is usually 50 degree. Uh, text say 49.9 degrees, something like that. The normal value is 50 degree. Now, if someone is having a protracted neck, what will happen is the angle is going to reduce less than 50 degree. Remember, not more than, less than. Because as the neck goes forward, the, the uh, head goes forward, the, the tragus also goes forward, this angle becomes much more acute. Then, 
once you have come to once you have quantified come to problem list first of all as we had discussed the the weight of the head increases because with each inch the neck goes forward the weight of the head increases by 10 pounds so if it is 3 inch forward the weight of the head becomes 42 pounds this picture is very popular this picture is created by eric dalton uh, but the but the base calculations were was given by kapanji i guess i a kapanji uh, the book, name of the book would be uh, biomechanics of the joints i guess uh, now we were talking about uh, thoracic outlet syndrome why this happens if you have studied uh, bd choracea uh, you must have studied the 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 axillary artery in detail that is a very common question in our anatomy in first year anatomy uh, we remember that axillary artery is divided into th three parts by by its uh, how how the pectoralis minor crosses as we were discussing pectoralis minor if it becomes tight what will happen is it will compress the axillary artery and along with the axillary artery the structure that goes along with the axillary artery is the lower trunk of brachial plexus so c8 and t1 so neurovascular bundle compression both the axillary subclavian artery as well as the the c8 and t1 nerve root the sign and symptoms will be of uh, uh, of thoracic outlet syndrome now uh, with only because of tightness of the uh, pectoralis minor thoracic outlet syndrome may not happen alone but if you if you remember the first chapter of david maggi there is something called as double crush syndrome a tight pectoralis minor makes the neurovascular bundle a little more vulnerable so if i have say some other compression as well in the c7 spine or some other compression as well in my in my ulnar nerve in the in the say cubital uh, in the around the elbow then this uh, multiple compromises in two places of the nerve can give rise to uh, kind of symptoms of uh, of uh, say uh, this this uh, was that upper cross syndrome uh, then thoracic outlet syndrome yeah i'm a little jittery with names sometimes sorry then the third problem is problems related to trigger points why trigger points occur trigger points occur because if there is uh, muscle imbalance if you give too much of load to a muscle then what happens is some of that some of the muscles become trigger point to give rest to the other muscles in simple terms uh, and what are the structures that are involved the pectoralis major is involved however i have not put that picture here you get upper trapezius trigger point which produces classic headache you get uh, trigger point of the uh, sternomastoid it also produces another type of headache so upper trapezius produces back of neck back of head uh, sternomastoid produces headache around the around the eye and upper around the forehead the classic feature of sternomastoid headache is all other headaches do not cross the midline however sternomastoid cross the midline at times then the next kind of headache is because of temporalis muscle uh, the tmj related muscle that produces headache you may ask what is the relationship between tmj and uh, upper cross syndrome which is otherwise a uh, neck and shoulder problem we'll come to that in the next picture and finally supraspinatus tendon as i said supraspinatus was compromised that is why supraspinatus may produce uh, trigger point and then the problem as you can see the referral pattern <coughs> is in the shoulder in the deltoid area uh, many of our patients you know if you if you open the textbook you will see that uh, conditions like frozen shoulder or periarthritis shoulder we say idiopathic condition the cause is unknown if you see many of them most of them have this upper cross syndrome posture there is muscle imbalance cervical range of motion is another problem before going that let us come to the headache once again A trigger point i will also cover the headache here uh, if you see the posterior part of the neck is now tight because of that poor posture so so what happens is tight lateral to occipital joint there is hyperextension there which also affects the structures the neurovascular the vascular structures going back 
through that area we will be compromised and that would be the vertebral artery going through the suboccipital triangle the muscles of the suboccipital triangle itself will become tight so the rcpm rectus capitis posterior major uh, superior obliquus and post, uh, inferior obliquus will will host the subox uh, the the uh, artery the the vertebral artery which goes upwards and supplies the back of the brain if this these muscles are tight because of the poor posture tight pectoralis uh, tight uh, trapezius and the uh, suboccipital muscles then also it produces headache uh, cervical range of motion because of this posture there is tightness in the posterior capsule of the atlanto occipital joint and that is why at one point of time with prolonged this posture the flexion is impaired on the other hand the cervical lower cervical extension uh, c3 downwards is also also reduced because the lower cervical spine is in flexion uh, and then what happens is shoulder range of motion uh, people who are sitting right now they can try this they can try protracting the shoulder medially rotate and lift the hand it's very difficult to get a complete range of motion because as we know the shoulder has to go into external rotation at one point of time that automatic rotation external rotation of shoulder uh, the codman's paradox or whatever you say uh, the external rotation is very important to gain a full range of motion also it is important to have a thoracic spine extension to get a full range of motion sometimes we miss that when we treat a shoulder patient so if you do the thoracic keep the thoracic spine in flexion in in a in a uh, kind of slouch position and protract the shoulder and then try to lift the arm it is not possible to produce a full range of motion and then uh, why i put this picture is shoulder motion is uh, is like an orchestra in an orchestra when orchestra is playing a harmony it is very important that every individual who is playing the orchestra from the violinist to to the flute person to everyone to work in sync everyone has their role defined and when the violin is playing maybe the tabla person is off and when the tabla is playing another person is off it works in sequel or in other words it works in synergy now if say upper trapezius is tight normally if you see any any normal good biomechanics book it will say that for flexion initial 45 to 60 degree the upper trapezius should remain silent and then after 60 degree only upper trapezius starts to move now you take a patient with upper cross syndrome his upper trapezius is always firing what will happen is the the scapular coordination you say or or uh, or uh, the kinesia or the or the timed firing will be affected so what will happen is the person will end up having a scapular dyskinesia the person will end up having a poor active or functional shoulder range of motion and then global muscle adjustments we are talking about why that lady was having mouth opening when the lady was having an upper cross syndrome posture because as the neck goes forward first thing happens is the sternomastoid is is shortened because the protrusion of the neck is the function of the bilateral sternomastoid next what happens is the forward anterior neck muscles the suprahyoids the sternohyoids omohyoids become stretched and that stretch opens the mouth so one thing is we start ending up we end up being a mouth breather of course nowadays with the corona mask we all are becoming mouth breather and uh, pallav sir is here so i don't have to explain what is the problem with uh, mouth breathing your mouth the, the air is not humidified and all uh, in this place another perspective is as the mouth remains open the normal tone of the mouth closing muscle for example the the uh, temporalis muscle will be affected so the you you'll end up having a temporalis muscle trigger point which will give give the patient temporal headaches as well uh, for me it is very easy to palpate the temporalis muscle for other patients also you can palpate the temporalis muscle and you can find out so uh, okay we were talking about palpation let me talk a little bit about palpation which muscles to palpate when you get a patient like that ask the patient to stand and palpate the upper trapezius both sides ideally they are they are usually tight now when they are bilaterally tight it is little difficult to understand so i'll uh, explain a technique of assessment taught to me by jenny mcconnell what she said was 
palpate the upper trapezius and ask the patient to flex only 45 degree and normally the trapezius should remain silent till 45 degree shoulder flexion it will it should function only at at uh, say 45 and above say 60 70 80 90 in a patient of upper upper cross syndrome or in a patient of upper trapezius hyperactivity you will see the you will feel the uh, muscle getting activated in the initial 30 45 degree range itself when a, when the patient is lifting the hand actively you can feel the trapezius you will feel the muscle is activated so that is one thing trapezius you can palpate also you can palpate the levator scapulae where do you palpate find the superior angle of the scapula and then the levator scapulae comes from c1 c2 c3 c4 to the superior angle of the scapula give a transverse palpation you'll be able to feel it supraspinal of course find the uh, find the uh, root of the spine of the scapula and the spine of the scapula just above the spine of the scapula give a vertical d palpation you can find the supraspinatus rhomboids you can find uh, you know that is a christmas tree muscle so you can you can give a transverse palpation all these muscles are usually tight sometimes it is unilateral pain sometimes it is bilateral pain uh, now the hallmark is it has to produce patients reproduce patients pain so it has to be the pain that the patient is suffering suffering from now once we come to management uh, in one word the management of the upper cross syndrome can be talked about as restoration of tensegrity by by modulating the myofascia which can be a multimodal approach it can be postural correction it can be ergonomics it can be corrective ex corrective exercise and manual therapy but uh, let me explain in two words what is tensegrity tensegrity is is uh, a, a concept which talks about uh, the relationship between muscle and bone tension tensional integrity is tensegrity so uh, the normal common example tensional integrity is is equal tension or normal tension in the myofascia uh, holds the structural components so if structural components are bone bones are held together by tension in the myofascia the examples that is commonly given is the example of a tent <clears throat> but i understand better with the example of an antenna so the pole of the tent or the pole of the antenna if you if you are too young to remember an antenna because it is the it is it is the era of uh, cable tv you remember the national flag when we waste waste national flag in uh, in 15th august there are ropes pulling the national flag or the antenna or the or the poles in the tent from different sides now tension in both sides of the flag pole or both sides of the ropes in the in the tent has to be equal or if you have ever used a, a mosquito net in the four corners the tension has to be equal if there is unequalness then what happens is the the mosquito net or the pole of the flag or the tent will become uneven and that's what happens normally the ear the shoulder the hip should be in one line now when i am in this position then there is tensional imbalance there is some muscles where there is more tension there is some muscle where there is less tension and over a period of time the structures that are having more tension will become short and over a period of time the structures which are having less tension will become lengthened so that's what happens and what you try to do you try to first uh, correct the loosen the joints which are tight put the joints in the proper position and 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 correct the tone of the structure so wherever there is increased tone you reduce the tone where there is reduced tone you increase the tone now these corrections can be done by either by active contraction or by positioning by taping or by uh, positioning by resetting the receptors where your manual therapy comes back or you do it by uh, active uh, or or conscious correction which would be which would be postural correction and ergonomics coming back to postural correction now treatment of upper cross syndrome is is half by you as a therapist more than 50% is the responsibility of the patient in general the treatment with manual therapy or treatment with physiotherapy is like that it is there is no magic pill that you take this pill your your loose motion will be all right you don't have to do anything you have to the patient has to take responsibility 
so always it is the patient's it is your responsibility to correct <laughs> but it is patient's responsibility to maintain the correction to reduce the pain so one uh, the the ways you you work with postural correction is number one mckenzie roll number two mulligan cushion you can do an irradiation which would be something like a, a pnf technique you can use an imagery to uh, give the patient an, an attractive or non-attractive image or you can do uh, uh, various kinds of taping mckenzie roll is basically used to maintain the spine in neutral position this is important why this is important is as i said that uh, in today's world we are sitting our our lifestyle demands that we sit more than 6 to 8 hours uh, you can see the techies they are sitting from 10 in the morning to to 6 in the evening and then they go back and they sit for two more hours for the pending job in the in the, in the office now our muscles simply do not have so much of endurance <clears throat> we call marathon runners as epitome of endurance but they also finish the 40 km run in two and a half three hours however a techie has to work for say say six to eight hours sitting in that position where both sides of his spinal extensors are working to maintain that position we we simply cannot maintain the position for so long so what do you do you do you give support so that the position can be maintained without muscular action which you can perform which you can give by using a simple beach towel roll giving in the hollow of the spine which is a mckenzie roll i have not given the given the example of a picture of the mulligan cushion here but it also works in the same way only thing is mulligan asks you to sit in a surface where the hip is higher than the knee so the body automatically adjusts into that uh, writing reaction and the the head is held straight uh, then imagery technique is when you put an image into patient's mind uh, what you can see from this image is an animal who is having the ear the shoulder and the hip in one horizontal line a human being should have an among all the god's creations nature's creation only human being can have consistently the ear the shoulder and the hip in one vertical line so it is the choice of the patient to be a human being or this animal where the the head the shoulder and the hip is one horizontal line so tell this patient that if you are if you are slouching forward you are becoming a pig if you are straightening up you are becoming a human being so probably giving this idea to the patient or some kind of imagery will help the patient to identify the poor position and and will give an internal reference of correctness if you go to uh, if you go to learning correct motion the motor control and motor learning the internal reference of correctness is very important and once the patient does this consciously for for 3 weeks to 6 weeks that unconscious control comes automatically uh, then you can use taping this is a rigid taping a postural correction tape a retraction of the scapula to hold this uh, uh, this this works in the short term and uh, good thing about taping is once you put the patient into a correct posture for a considerable time so one day or two day body sort of reminds itself that this is the correct position and once you remove the tape also in most of the cases the body is able to maintain the original correct position this is a rigid tape the mechanical property of the tape will be able to hold the posture however nowadays what is popular is kinesio tape works as good and you can use that and you can stimulate the proprioceptors to to maintain the posture you can perform uh, you can give multiple layers of taping the blue tape here inhibits the trapezius by giving a transverse kind of tape uh, the pink tape here is to stimulate the scapular retractors sometimes you may need to give one more tape around the shoulder to maintain the external rotation uh, however i am against using too much of tape this is this is a technique that is used to be used in egypt ancient egypt they used to call them as mummification they used to put layers of tape in the dead body however do not put so many so much of tape on the patient because uh, number one it is not cost effective number two it is 
it is uh, very uh, very odd and very difficult to for the patient to maintain so unless the patient wants to show off uh, tapes like this there is no point there is uh, really really no, no need to use uh, so much of tape and the tapes are costly you know? uh, coming to trigger points there are uh, multitudes of ways to tackle trigger point you can use uh, needling you can use cupping you can use myofascial release you can stretch you can tape for the trigger trigger point you can use other sorts of therapy something called as istm and, and many other techniques and uh, there is you cannot say that this technique is superior this technique is inferior uh, personally i i uh, prefer starting with uh, cupping stretch and mfr and if if they are in the first day if they are not not giving away so much then on the second session i would uh, go for needling the structures uh, if if there is no other indications contraindications present but uh, frankly speaking all of these techniques are effective and uh, the the usefulness of these techniques will depend from individual to individual however coming to trigger points i would like to reiterate one of my favorite quote given by chaitav he says trigger points are like fire alarm if your treatment consists only of trigger point release that means you are breaking down the fire alarm that is not a wise thing to do means trigger points are there because there is some inherent imbalance or pathology or something going on and trigger points are just the just the signs something like fever so if there is fever and you are only treating it with paracetamol then the fever is bound to come back if it is an infectious condition so if there is trigger point please do not stop at releasing the trigger point do not please do investigate why the trigger point is coming otherwise what happens you know and i'm sure whoever us of of us are practicing uh, physiotherapy on actual patients with with responsibility will will have faced this kind of situation that one day you have say release the trigger points of the pectoralis major next day the patient comes with the trigger point in the in the posterior side or another muscle that is because trigger points are body's way of of correcting the imbalance body's way of handling the problem and if you are releasing it without treating the other other root causes then body will form another set of trigger point in another area so uh, trigger points and then uh, you can use also uh, met one of my very favorite technique because uh, it 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 takes uh, very less time yields fantastic results and and uh, is not invasive so the patients do not get as scared as when you say i am going to put a needle or i am going to put a cup with fire so uh, apotropisia spectrals whatever uh, structures are tight you can perform a muscle energy technique very easily on them uh, first thing you must do is uh, try and do suboccipital release not only in upper cross syndrome but also in in patients whoever is having headache because this this uh, muscles especially the three muscles that we had discussed about the obliquus capitis superior the obliquus capitis inferior and the rectus capitis posterior major through this we get that vertebral artery and if these muscles are tight the vertebral artery gets compressed and the back of the head gets heavy and then there is pain and uh, also the structures uh, here you, you also get the greater occipital nerve which gets uh, compressed and everything so re releasing this also also this area has a lot of uh, lot of uh, other nerves so releasing this immediately triggers a parasympathetic response that produces relaxation you can visibly see the patient is breathing deeper with a more relaxation and uh, it yields also very well it, it releases immediately reduces the headache and you can use this as a preparatory uh, way to re reduce all the uh stretch uh, stress of the other muscles the the tension of the other muscles and your stretching becomes much easier if you want you can monitor the patient's heart rate before and after in many cases you can see that there is a visible difference because of the parasympathetic sympathetic activation and that is that's how powerful this technique is and uh, finally you have to come to mobilization uh, and uh, start with self exercise start with mckenzie's retraction or chin tuck technique now while performing chin tuck because this is not our usual work and most of us have 
a little bit of tight posterior joint capsule of atlanta occipital joint and so this what it does is this technique as you can see it reverses the deformity what is the deformity extension in the atlanta occipital joint and flexion in the lower cervical spine chin tuck produces uh, the flexion in the upper cervical spine uh, atlanta occipital joint and uh, extension in the in the lower cervical spine c3 downwards however what happens is if you are doing it for the first time it becomes distinctly uncomfortable because this, the 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 capsules which are tight is getting stretched so some people do not tolerate this very well so if you want to give this the dosage is every 2 hour 10 repetition uh, for many patients many people this is not very comfortable so in such a case start it in supine because with supine the the muscles that maintain the posture is relaxed so it is it is much less muscular work so try chin tuck in supine for initial 2 days and once and as and when the patient is more comfortable doing it in standing come back to standing position then this is mulligan's reverse nag where the the upper components are held together uh, the the uh, and you focus your your force into a, a single vertebral motion segment where you try to create an extension by pushing down uh, so basically it is also a kind of replicating a mckenzie retraction how mckenzie retraction is happening in all the segment this you can specify a specific particular segment then coming to strengthening strengthening is a matter of debate because our muscles to maintain posture do not need strength they need more of endurance however strength is always a reserve a good reserve to have so if you are strengthening because in case in case of crest syndrome there is selective strengthening of the muscles that should not be strengthened so you need to strengthen the opposite group of muscles for example if pectoralis major minor is 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 overactive you need to strengthen the scapular retractors also lower serratus anterior because because they get weak and as we know the lower serratus anterior upper trapezius has a torque in moving the scapula and once this becomes weak and upper trapezius overactive what happens is the scapular dyskinesia occurs and core stabilization is always always important it's like finishing job of 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 your interior decor or interior decoration is core stabilization once you you finish core stabilization along with all your manual therapy and other strengthening exercises the patient is going to have a long term relief and the self exercises that we give are pectoral stretch against the wall uh, understand this pectoralis major is a huge muscle so you, it has a clavicular fiber it has sternal fibers it also has abdominal fibers so stretching the pectoralis major against the doorway or against the wall needs to happen in multiple angles if you if you are stretching the pectoralis major only at 90 degree you are not you are not targeting all the muscle fibers you need to do it above 90 at 90 as well as below 90 pectoralis minor can be stretched in the same fashion keeping the elbow straight so if you do this elbow straight with a hand in uh, say palm upwards it will become pectoralis minor stretch if you do it like this it will become pectoralis major stretch the slouch over correct is is one of mckenzie's most effective exercises what happens is if you are in this position for prolonged amount of time what tends to happen is the muscles become tight because because our muscles are such our myofascia is such whenever there is staticness there is laying down of the collagen cross fibers so every now and then if you move what will happen is you are giving the body signal that this is this structure is supposed to move so the the collagen uh, alignment happens okay upper trapezius stretch is uh, also called as back pocket stretch the side you want to stretch you keep the hand on the opposite side back pocket so if this is my right hand i'm trying to keep it next to my left greater trochanter and then i am turning my neck a little bit towards the left side and then i am pulling the head down like this when you ask the patient to do this please understand that this is a very strong stretch so a patient who has less mobility in the cervical spine or a patient who has uh 
a very tight upper trapezius be judicious with the over pressure of the head maybe in the initial days a position and the side tilt is good enough slouch over correct i'll show in the next gif mckens retractions we had discussed what is push up plus push up plus is an exercise which tends to activate the lower serratus center it's just like simple push up at the end of the push up you do a lot of as strong protraction as possible that is called as push up with a plus plus is the protraction <clears throat> you can start it at the wall and as the patient's ability increases you can come to a table come to a chair and at the end if the patient allows then probably you go into the floor and then strengthening of external rotators because uh, pectoralis major is overactive and tight so that is internal rotator you need to strengthen the external rotators all right so the first picture retraction the second one is slouch and over correct as you can see the slouching is uh, self explanatory while over correcting the chest is thrust outside so that gives a full straightening of the thoracic spine uh, mobilization very good mobilization of the lumbar spine as well and uh, and the pectoralis the retractors also also get get to work a little and the pectoralis major gets uh, somewhat going to the neutral position uh, looking at this gif i would also like to draw your attention towards correction of the upper cross syndrome position not only needs to happen from the neck unless you correct the lumbar spine the pelvis posture the things will not be aligned because this is the base this is the foundation the lumbar spine the pelvis unless the foundation is proper the the tower over that the building over that will not be aligned so when someone is in poor posture correcting upper cross syndrome not only corrects the neck is involves correction of the neck position but also correction of the uh, pelvis the lumbar spine as well so these are the things that i wanted to discuss related to upper cross syndrome i would like to project a few videos related to upper cross syndrome and uh, uh, some of the some of this are actual patients uh, i hope that you do not use this uh, in in uh, anywhere else because i have taken their permission and taken the pictures or videos i hope that uh, uh, we will together will be able to maintain their their privacy i will uh, project some of the videos okay so let me know if you are able to see the screen otherwise uh, patient's life then the patient number 1 becomes pain free early number 2 has has more confidence on you number 3 can can uh, utilize that time much better then uh, uh, nayanika madam how will upper cross syndrome further result in lower cross syndrome uh, would be a long session but as you can as you can understand with the imbalance you know imbalance in the uh, shoulder goes down to imbalance in the thoracic and lumbar spine so your pelvis which is uh, at one in the anterior side uh, say say abdomen pulls it up and uh, hip flexors pulls it down that balance in the, in the back side you have the trunk extensor pulling it up and hip extensors gluteus max as well as your hamstrings pulling it down that fine balance goes away and what you have is usually a type 1 upper cross lower cross syndrome is when your uh, uh, pelvis is pulled down anteriorly so you get an anterior pelvic tilt because of tight uh hip flexors and in that case you'll get a tight uh, trunk extensors and weak hamstring and g max and weak abdominal muscles is a classic uh, type 1 lower cross syndrome uh, uh surajit yes hi ritu ma'am thank you thank you ma'am for all the appreciation uh, uh thank you so much uh, uh, good ganesh. evening this is ganesh yes, can i yes, have sir. a question please sir Uh, when when uh, we are looking at upper trapezius, can you tell me your take on the clinical uh, practice on the patients? Uh, how far have you checked on the role of 
uh, deltoid and the rotator cuff contributing for the upper trapezius. Sir, uh, the deltoid and rotator cuff would be coexisting, uh, like especially the rotator cuff, you know, will have a coexisting problem with the upper, uh, upper trapezius tightness. I have not checked the deltoid in, in, the, in, the, in the relationship uh, along with the upper trapezius. Okay. However, uh, as, you have, as you have picked my interest, I can I can understand the uh, to some extent uh, the interrelationship, and uh, probably would uh, give a look into deltoid as well. Yeah, because when when you showed me the uh, image of the upper trapezius palpating and the levator, I thought you will be going to come onto it. Uh, this is how I am practicing. So if right. you look at the upper trapezius, and as you clearly mentioned. You palpate and check for the upper trapezius if it is activating at the 45 degree angle, you know, right. where you actually want the upper uh, trapezius to be firing only above 90. Until then, it's going right. to be the deltoid right. that has to be right. firing. If we have the upper trapezius firing, that means the deltoid is more inhibited. So what yes. I do is I, I try and get the deltoid to activate because only if the deltoid functions, the upper trapezius will work less. So right, right, right. when you see people complain, the patient's complain is mm -hmm. when I lift something or when I'm doing driving or when I'm writing, I get my neck or the upper trapezius region pain where it is a shoulder function. So you will also find the rotator cuff, if it is weak, if it is not able to hold on, that is again not going to let the deltoid and you will right. find that come back all to the upper trapezius. So you will exactly. find that the source of the problem will be to come either from the deltoid or further down to the cuff. So that will be something I will suggest you to just uh, look into the clinical practice and if you can give me some feedback, I will also be happy. Of course, of course. Makes absolute sense, sir. So thank you so much for uh, joining in and uh, leaving some clinical pearls. Thank you. Uh, so Hi, are... sir. Subhanjan, sir. Uh, hello. Sumanan hello. Is here. Yes, sir. Yes, Subhanjan, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Subhanjan, sir, sometime uh, what happened uh, after correction of this upper cross syndrome, Again, mm -hmm. uh, just after six month, patient came back with the same problem. Right. Yeah, so lot of re re reoccurrence is very common in upper cross syndrome. Yes. Yeah. So, uh, in such cases, when we uh, check about the their another chain, uh, especially for rectus abdominis, uh -huh. lot of time I found out there is a tightness in rectus abdominis. Yes. which causes drag the complete uh, their uh, upper thoracic case which causes the more pressure in c7 t1 uh -huh. and four as you say the, there is a rightening uh, reflex rightening action of our head head right. have a lot of uh, proprioception so our main motto to keep our boss that is brain we should be in a particular stabilized position so our neck is completely compromised their posture for just give a good platform. So when we just work on rectus abdominis and of course along with the hamstring, so complete chain will be help yes. lot. Yes, yes. To recover all this reoccurrence compared to only the part of upper cross treatment. Definitely, definitely. Yes. Again, again, next, next absolute so okay thank you sir some more, some more clinical pearls thank you sir for chipping in uh, i hope i hope, uh, not only like it is it is going to help us, it's also going to improve my clinical practice as well thank you uh, any more question chetali thank you thank you chetali thank you for joining in uh, from kolkata devraj uh, long time devraj how are you ganesh sir is right definitely sir is uh, great session, thank you. Kinetic chain, Surajit, you are you are much more proficient in kinetic chain than me, so I would leave that uh, to you. Uh, thank you, thank you. 
all right so uh, anything anything else uh, shubhanjan sir am i audible yes yes sir sir uh, sir it was a stupendous session from your end and uh, you, see you are getting big round of applause from pallav sir also <laughs> it's visible <laughs> so the best part was we were having a very good amalgamation of the clinicians students and academicians in your session we have uh, we have attendees from jnk to tamil nadu uh -huh. and in the 80 attendees who were present in the session there were around from six countries dr tarun amal nirkar he was from malaysia one madam she was joining from dubai two physios were there oh, with you from united states of america one one from australia uh -huh. and i think one or two from nepal also so this is your great aura that people have been attracted for your session my honor and uh, the I best had, i had is, my students here i had my senior uh, pallav sir ganeshan sir i had taken a uh, a session from ganeshan ganeshan sir so he had he had been my teacher and so so it has been a kind of uh, Uh, and sir, you will be also as well. happy to you will be also happy to know that tomorrow Ganeshan sir will be there as a resource person yes, at the I same have, time. Yes, and uh, it will be, I think, again a very interactive session tomorrow. So thanks for being on the stage on the podium today. Over to you, Dr. Himanshu. So thank you, sir. Thank you very very much for. so much enlightening and wonderful and amazing session i actually i don't have any words to express my feelings that i have never learned the upper crow syndrome like this and i think most of the student like me who are average does never study the books properly so <laughs> it is actually a good thing for us that we can remember here we can recall the things here so it really we are very grateful to you sir and it is definitely your aura that uh, as her sir told we have the peoples we have the professionals from all, all around the globe similarly the very importantly we have few dignitaries who have joined us even i i would say they are joining us at first for this webinar series like uh, the teachers of the teacher professor sanjeev kumar sir from kl institute of physiotherapy he is a professor and principal there so he has joined us i think he might be here or might not be here so he has joined us for your session sir so this definitely is your aura and ganeshan sir definitely we have one session we had with one session with ganeshan sir and we are we would be having one more session with the ganeshan sir so har sir pallav sir ritu ma'am kalpana ma'am jitan sir tarun amal nirkar sir joining from the malaysia amita anu sharma ma'am my my teacher also the charu ma'am as the har sir and pallav sir so we have most of the uh, senior dignitaries senior faculty members present over here and this is actually the uh, impact of the session that it has so interactive we have so much curiosity is because we were listening continuously even i think uh, up to me this was the first session when i have not left the screen for a, even a minute neither in sometimes i just move no. outside there is some disconnection and this again my fortune that i was fortunate to attend the session continuously first time it happened that the session was not disconnected for me neither i met became outside from the session sometimes so thank you sir thank you very very much we are really grateful to you have us here yes. pleasure really. and really means uh, you made the session highly highly interactive so thank you sir thank you very very much thanks to all the teachers who supported us pallav sir har sir ritu ma'am thanks to you all and even though we also had uh, harpreet sir here harpreet sir also joined us jeban daniel sir from the indor choitram hospital so many senior persons who joined us so i would like to say heartful thank to all the teachers uh, faculty members teachers of the teachers so we are really thankful to you for joining us and making the session most interactive most uh, learning session for us so thank you sir and thank we'll you. meet again tomorrow at 9 pm Uh, for the ganeshan sir session it is on the topic hamstring so we'll have more of the understanding of the hamstring tomorrow and subhanjan sir it is great really it's great so we are really thankful to you thank you sir thanks that's a pleasure an honor
so thank you thank you very much to you all we'll meet again tomorrow till then bye bye stay tuned stay safe stay in touch thank you good night good night to everyone thank you so much for giving me so much of time bye bye thank you sir thank you very much